who in the music education world even talks about financial stuff, you know, because I know like even when I graduated college and got my first teaching job and the secretary at the school handed me this budget and I was like, oh, awesome. I have all this money, not knowing that that was the money they expected me to raise. That wasn't necessarily what I had in the account. <laughs> and yeah, and, and I like I'd worked at Summer Haze for six years at that point. <laughs> I was like, I should probably know how to read a budget. Um, so if, if, if I was unprepared, certainly other teachers were. You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. Let's do this thing. Welcome to episode two of the Music Ed Mentor Podcast. I am your host, Elisa Jones. You can follow my music education blog at professionalmusiceducator.com, and I invite you to join the online Facebook group, Music Educators Off the Podium, to connect with other school music teachers and find tips and tricks to help make your life easier as a music teacher. In this episode, I share my interview with a good friend of mine, Chris Barons. He's manager of Summer Hayes Music Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he's also on the board of the National Association of School Music Dealers. He shares with us in this episode some tips on how to work more effectively with your music store, not only to get the service you deserve, but also some secret hacks you can try to get the equipment you need with the budget you have, no matter what that budget might be. But first, let me share a little bit about this episode's sponsor, Smart Music. You and I both know that one of the best ways a student can develop their musical prowess is by practicing their scales and arpeggios. The only thing that holds most of them back is they are so, dare I say, boring. That's where smart music comes in. This takes learning the scales and arpeggios from blah to awesome, which means they'll actually want to practice them even in the summertime. Now take five seconds and think about how that might affect your ensemble this fall. Okay, time's up. I also have a very special invitation for you today, especially those of you who need more money for instrument repairs, replacing old instruments, or maybe you've grown your program and need more instruments or supplemental equipment. For you choir teachers, maybe you need new risers, a sound shell, uniforms, or elementary teachers who want to start a guitar class or get ukuleles, or maybe a classroom set of ORF instruments. At the end of June, my friend Wendy Higdon whose blog you can find at onandoffthepodium.com will be offering a free webinar for music teachers where we will walk you step by step through how to create a plan to get more of the equipment and instruments that you need. We'll talk about the data you need to find, how to fund it, and most of all, how to think like an administrator so you can present it to them and they will support you and throw the money that you need your way. And who couldn't use that? We'll also be giving you the exact layouts, templates, and files you need so that it's simple and easy. These are templates I've created for you that work. They are plug and play and you won't find them anywhere else. We'll be opening registration for that webinar soon, so be sure you get over to my website, professionalmusiceducator.com, and sign up for my newsletter list. That way you'll get notified when registration is open. I do hope that you will join us. Now, here's my interview with Chris Barons. So let's jump into some of these questions. Uh, well, actually, why don't you first tell us a little bit about your background in music retail? Uh, background in music retail. I, my name is Chris Barons with Summer Hayes Music Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I got my start in the music industry. I went to school to learn how to do band repair in Red Wing, Minnesota. And uh, that's how I got my start at Summer Heights. I did that for the first five to six years. And then um, I moved, I, I knew I wasn't the greatest repair technician, but I moved on to sales and uh, ended up going back to school to take you know, your accounting business, marketing, all those 
fun classes that you need to uh, run a business and then worked my way up uh, to the store manager position, which I've held for the past 20 years. Starting in repair is a great way. I learned so much about you know, band direct, band orchestra directors from their, as far as their repair needs, what they need, how they get beat up, destroyed. I'm, I'm very, very glad that I started there and worked my way, way up. Yeah, definitely a good way to build those connections. So why don't we talk about repairs first? Because you don't need a replacement plan so much if you have pretty steady repair um, needs being fulfilled, right? So I feel like for, for band and orchestra teachers especially, keeping functioning instruments in the hands of kids is like the biggest challenge, whether it's reeds or, you know, my valve is stuck or my mouthpiece is stuck again. So do you find that most teachers just get things fixed as they break? Do they learn to fix things themselves? Or do you see some big, some, you know, being smart about regular maintenance? Or, or what, what should people do about repairs? In an ideal world, if budgets allow, you know, getting, getting them on a cycle to have them uh, checked, checked through and gone through once a year, every other year, maybe, you know, maybe one year you're doing brass, maybe the next year you're doing your woodwinds, or, you know, cellos one year, violins another year. In an ideal world, just having them all going through and maintain, just like you would change the oil in your car, the wiper fluid, rotate the tires, so on and so forth, you can get a lot more mileage out of it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, not every school is lucky to have that, and some are, have little to no repair budgets and they're just on a but if it's not broke don't fix it kind of a budget right so I think, I think a lot of it just depends on the schools and the school budgets and how it works but like I said the ideal situation is to maintain it just like you would your car or anything else that needs regular maintenance well I know in in a couple of the schools where I've I've worked or helped out um, I'll, I'll make a comment to an older director, you know, like this trumpet really should be replaced. And they'll say, well, what's the point in replacing an old Selmer trumpet? Like that's a high quality trumpet. I don't want to get things now. Things nowadays are made so cheaply that they just don't hold up. Have you found that to be true in your experience? Uh, yes and no. I, you know, just like cars that are made in the 50s and 60s, they huh? Everyone has argument that you know the older stuff was made so much better, but you know there is a ton of stuff out there now that's just as good, if not better, than it was 50 years ago because technology allows us to make them bigger, better, stronger, and in some cases a little cheaper. So a lot of it's just you know doing your homework on the particular brand or model, um, even if it's a recommendation from a fellow teacher to Find out what's the lifespan on these things. What what are other people saying about them? So are there like industry specs as far as lifespan and what regular maintenance needs are? Are there any, you know, checklists, do these things to your trumpet this often, that kind of thing? Like we know we should have the oil changed in our car every 3,000 miles, but it, is there anything, you know, to guide us for our instruments, how often those really need to be checked in on? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, a lot of the, you know, brass instruments, you can get them flushed out once a year. That's always a great thing to do because they're blowing, you know, Mountain Dew, Snickers, whatever else through it. Just the general acid in the human body being blown through a brass instrument has so much acid in it that it can slowly eat away from the inside out on a brass instrument. So. Having those flushed out on a regular basis always helps, and then you know, getting the oil, old valve oil, cleaned out, switched out during that process helps the valve run smoother, which helps cut down on sticking. Same with you know, uh, regreasing the slides on all your brass instruments, keep those from freezing up and causing even more damage and more extensive repairs in the future. Um, strings can be the same way, you know, keeping an eye on the bridge and the fingerboard and the pegs. Because if you can catch some of those things earlier before they come major issues, 
that helps as well. But as far as, you know, this is what you should do on your violins, it's, or your trumpets or your flutes, and on a yearly maintenance plan, there's, there's no set standard. Well, I know in, in a couple of the schools where I've, I've worked or helped out, um, I'll, I'll make a comment to an older director, you know, like, this trumpet really should be replaced. And they'll say, well, what's the point in replacing an old Selmer trumpet? Like, that's a high-quality trumpet. I don't want to get things now. Things nowadays are made so cheaply that they just don't hold up. Have you found that to be true in your experience? Uh, yes and no. I, you know, just like cars that are made in the 50s and 60s, they, you know, everyone has the argument that you know, the older stuff was made so much better. But you know, there is a ton of stuff out there now that's just as good, if not better, than it was 50 years ago because technology allows us to make them bigger, better, stronger, and in some cases a little cheaper. So a lot of it's just you know, doing your homework on the particular brand or model um, even if it's a recommendation from a fellow teacher to find out what's the lifespan on these things. What what are other people saying about them? So are there like industry specs as far as lifespan and what regular maintenance needs are? Are there any, you know, checklists, do these things to your trumpet this often, that kind of thing? Like we know we should have the oil changed in our car every 3,000 miles, but it, is there anything, you know, to guide us for our instruments, how often those really need to be checked in on? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, a lot of the, you know, brass instruments, if you can get them flushed out once a year, that's always a great thing to do because they're blowing, you know, Mountain Dew, Snickers, whatever else through it. Just the general acid in the human body being blown through a brass instrument has so much acid in it that it can slowly eat away from the inside out on a brass instrument. So having those flushed out on a regular basis always helps. And then, you know, getting the oil, old valve oil cleaned out, switched out during that process helps the valve run smoother, which helps cut down on sticking. Same with, you know, uh, regreasing the slides on all your brass instruments, keep those from freezing up and causing even more damage and more extensive repairs in the future. Um, strings can be the same way, you know, keeping an eye on the bridge and the fingerboard and the pegs. Because if you can catch some of those things earlier before they come major issues, that helps as well. But as far as, you know, this is what you should do on your violins, it's, or your trumpets or your flutes, and, on a yearly maintenance plan, there's, there's no set standard. Hmm. But a majority of you know, manufacturers will give suggestions, you know, just like oil in your car or every 3,000 to 5,000 miles kind of a thing. Right. But nothing, nothing set in stone. Interesting. Okay. So in, in your experience, how do most schools handle the budgets for repairs or even new equipment? Do they tend to come from the school or the district? Do they have their own budget they get to work with? How, is, how does that work in, in your experience? Uh, it varies from district to district. Some, we have one district where they just have one giant repair and they budget and they divide it amongst all the schools. And then we have another district where each individual school is responsible for their own repair budget. Um, so it, it really just varies depending on how the, the district set up and how they distribute the funds. Right. Well, I remember when I was opening a new school my first year, and I know you were around back then, when I was deciding what I wanted to have as inventory for my school, I wanted not the cheapest, I wanted like pretty decent quality stuff, but I also wanted to buy it from the stores that I was connected to locally. But the district had a standard procedure for buying new instruments where you had to submit the brand and model and how many you liked, and then they would put it up on a website. And then people from all over the country could, could bid on it. And I know that's probably still the case now. So I was kind of sneaky and went and was more specific in what I said I wanted as far as specs, 
so that I got the instruments from my local dealers. Like, I don't know if a lot of teachers know how to do that kind of thing, but do, do you find that teachers do that backdoor kind of way to get what they want from who they want? Or is it just me? Uh, no, there's, there's some out there that do, do, that do exactly that, and they get rewarded by doing that, by receiving, like you said, the good quality product that you do want instead of, you know, I'm asking for this particular brand of trumpet and this toy trumpet shows up and they're horribly disappointed. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that whatsoever. It's like, you know, you order five math books for your class. I want this particular math book so my students can learn, right? Right. So sure enough, if you don't put no substitutes on it, you're going to get a different brand of math book than what the rest of the kids have. Right. So when you say turn to page six, you have 30 different people turning into 12 different types of books, on, and no one has the same page six. So I think it's very important to figure those little things out in regards to, you know, no substitutions or... I want this clarinet with this mouthpiece and a mouthpiece patch and these two reeds on it delivered, assembled together and inspected. Mm -hmm. That way you're not getting some weird instrument that you've never heard of that's going to end up draining your repair budget every year for the next 15 years. Right. When all you had, all they had to do was spend another eighty-six dollars or something like that, and you would have had a better instrument to begin with. Yeah, it's unfortunate how almost chintzy our school systems have really become. Instead of getting quality, they do tend to go for the the lower price thing just to fit it into the budget. Which, you know, in the long run, we really just need to have that kind of data to show that the higher quality instrument is going to save on repairs in the long run. And I always like to include in my purchase orders that it should include like a six month service contract kind of thing. And that's what helps keep it local. And I'm a big fan, not just because of, you know, my time at, at Summer Hayes and at Roper Music and these other music stores I've worked with, um, but I'm a big fan about going local. And I know that's a big movement kind of nationwide to shop local, to keep that tax revenue where it goes into things like, oh, you know, teacher salaries. Um, so where it seems like you can get anything online these days, even instrument rentals, what are some of the best reasons that you would say music educators should be using their local music store and continuing to develop that relationship? Well, I think you touched on probably one of the biggest ones is keeping those tax dollars in the state because the tax dollars would hopefully get turned around and put right back into the schools, which would hopefully mean a little bit more repair budget, being able to buy a little bit nicer instruments, so on and so forth. I mean, that's one of the, the big ones. And then, um, and then, you know, other things you're doing, you know, are they providing a road rep service where people from the store come on a weekly or a monthly basis, pick up and drop off repairs, uh, you know, you call them, you order, I need a box of reeds for my concert tomorrow night. Most stores with their weight in gold will provide these type of services where your online stores, you know, if, if you get it and you order a box of number three reeds and they ship you a box of number two, well, you got to now stop what you're doing, take it down, ship it back, print out the return label, wait another four days for it to show back up. And the road reps using your local music store for that is a big deal as well. And, uh, and then, you know, paying attention to what your local music stores are doing in the community to advocate for music. You know, are they sponsoring events at your school? Are they making your annual MEAs better, learning experience for you? Do they help you with recruiting? You, we were talking about recruiting earlier. Are they bringing like step up instruments to your school so the kids can know that oh there's you know a better instrument out there that will make me sound better, which will make the band sound better, and now they're getting 
you know, better rating that state competitions. So it's just those little things like that, you know, are the music stores, are they advocating for music at the government level to keep music in the schools? I think, you know, any store that's doing those kind of things, got to figure out a way to reward them because it also benefit you in the long run as well. Right. Well, and I think you touched on the advocacy thing and, and I'm, I'm really passionate about that bit that music as music teachers, we really shouldn't be the number one advocates for music. That's just like an executive director of a nonprofit fundraising for their own salary. You know, um, of course you want music in the school. It's, it's paying your bills at home. So to, to, the administrative minds that doesn't work as a viable argument, but you get a business owner in there saying, yes, we need music in our schools. It's, it's helping thrive our economy and all of these other reasons, you know, that's a far more powerful advocate voice than just the voice of the local music teacher. But that's a, that's that's a right. and like, podcast for another time too. <laughs> yes, it is. I want to be in on that one. That one would be fun. Oh, for sure. So tell me about music stores. What are the products and services that most carry? And I know we all think as music teachers, we think band, orchestra, probably some guitars, percussion. Um, what are some other things that local music stores can help with? Anything for choir, general music, elementary music teachers like myself? Yes. Well, the majority of them that are going to carry your band and orchestra instruments, you know, percussion and guitars. They're also going to carry, you know, some of the essentials that you need for choir. You know, who doesn't need folders for choir kind of a thing. Most of them are going to have access to being able to order in the chairs that you would need or risers or stuff like that. You know, general music and elementary teachers are needing orphan instruments, and they're going to have a good supply of those. And if not, they have three different distributors that you just give them a list, they can order it in. So they have, most of them should have either in stock or access to it to be able to help you out because you know, not every store can carry every single thing. And then, you know, of course, that's the beauty of online, but still go back to, you know, support the local that they can still provide you with the same product and the same things that you need to run a successful program, then maybe it's worth waiting another day or paying 20 cents more. Right. Because, again, we go back to, are those guys going to be there for me for recruiting or special events? So what if we're in, like, a really small town? I'm thinking somewhere like, oh, Monticello, Utah, or Blanding, or Mexican Hat, you know? Um, how do we work with a local music store if there isn't one in the area? Um, a music store, whether they're two minutes away or 200 miles away, is still going to figure out a way to get those products to you and service you. It, it, it shouldn't matter where you live. Most, any store will figure out a way to make that work for you. Okay. Got shipping, driving. I'd love to go all of those just for a vacation anyway. <laughs> so yeah. Make a trip out of it. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a that's a great area of the country for sure. So, do you have any recommendations on what teachers who have little or no budget can do to finance repairs or replacement or supplement instruments and equipment? Um, are, are used instruments from the music store an option, or do you not do that for schools? Kind of talk to us about financing things. Wow, oh, where to start? Well, for those that are on a on a on a budget, there's a there's a place called um, bgefinancial.com, and they are a financial institution that deals with school lease purchase plan programs. So let's just pretend that, you know, all right, I need $10,000 worth of stuff, but I maybe get $2,000 a year. 
Well, rather than just buying 2000 this year, 2000 next year, 2000 the year after that, the school or the district can go and finance it over a five-year period. That way you can get your stuff all at once. Right. And kind of rotate those out. And, uh, and another reason for doing that is especially if, you know, you're buying some brass for, you know, brass prices are going up every year or, you know, certain woods on string instruments might be going up or harder to get every year kind of a thing. Doing that lease option can help with inflation over those amount of times as well. So, so you, the, that's, that's one. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I was just going to ask, so you can get financing through BGE Financial, but still buy at your local music store? Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah, you just send out your bid like you normally do, you get it approved, and then go through these guys for the for the financing, and it really helps schools replace older instruments that are depleting their repair budgets. And again, you know, it gives music educators opportunity to obtain needed instruments to complete a successful music program while rem remaining within their budget. And then, you know, if you have a store that offers, you know, band and orchestra, you know, rent-to-own programs, there's some of those instruments that, you know, the kids will rent for like three or four months and go, uh, I don't think saxophone is for me. I'd like to try trumpet. Well. You pretty much have a brand new horn with very little wear on it, and any store with its weight in gold is going to have a really good band and string repair shop that goes through these instruments each time they come back. Mm -hmm. So why not ask, hey, give me a bid on new blah, 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 or a used blah, blah, blah. Right. And like you were saying, you know, maybe include a 30, 60, 90 day adjustment repair type plan with it as well. So every little little dollar counts. So you know, lean on your PTAs, lean on any of your boosters or fundraisers. That they live for that. They love it. That's true. Yeah, I think of my dad who used to run a university program and he would always get on to oh what was it? One of the military surplus sites actually and he would buy the instruments that the military would age out. You know, they'd come to the end of their manufacturer recommended lifespan and and they would age out and go to surplus. Have you heard of anyone else doing something like that? Yeah, it's it, you can hunt those down, you know, you can shop your local classifieds, surplus, and there's two or three other things. I'd say the biggest thing is making sure that you can put your hands on it, take a look at it, or better yet, you know, take someone from your local repair shop with you to go look at them before you buy them. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, oh, yeah, a $300 French horn, this is awesome. I saved myself $1,000. Right. Only to find out that you had to put $1,200 in it to get it working. But, uh, yes, yeah, so there's plenty of avenues out there about how aggressive you want to be about it. Right. Well, I think it just comes down to how, yeah, how, how, how smart you are about it, how passionate you are about it, what kind of resources you have. I know I was certainly privileged to have my music store experience so that I, I kind of had firsthand experience on a lot of brands and models and makes and stuff like that. And, and I wish everybody who graduated in music ed could spend like a semester working in a music store just because you learn just so much stuff about the industry that's directly applicable to your role as a music teacher. Wouldn't that be nice? And even if you don't, go, go, go take a business 101 class or an accounting 101 class and, and learn that aspect of it. And the, you're being an orchestra director. It's, it's amazing. They do so much. A, they're a teacher. B, they're many HR people all day long, right? You know, call me picked on me or, you know, I'm <laughs> empty to spit valve on my head. And, I mean, they're HR directors as well, but they're also, you know, learn, you're running a mini business more so than any of the other 
teachers in the school because there's so many variables and you know purchasing new instruments and 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 repairs and accessories and concerts and so on and so forth. Those are all, you know, how am I going to get money? How am I going to spend the money? What's the best way to spend the money? Um, so yeah, I, if you could tag along in a music store, great. Not get into some business management 101 books for fun. I know it's a great read while you're in your hammock, but <laughs> well, I, I laugh. You really are running a little mini business. Well, that's exact. I mean, people like I know I'm weird for having an MBA, but that's exactly why I did it because I knew I would want to go back into music education, and it's exactly like you said it's running your own little business. So, what could they teach me in business management school that wouldn't be applicable for the rest of my life and my career? Right? Oh, and at home. I mean. Should I buy one box of Go-Gurts or should I buy two boxes of Go-Gurts? I mean, you can, <laughs> you can use that business management both in your personal life, school, and maybe, you know, even start your own business someday. There's, you cannot go wrong. It was one of the best things I ever did. Yeah, me too. Agreed. All right. Well, that takes me through all the questions I had for you. But is there anything else that you'd like to say along the lines of, instrument replacement, repair, financing, anything like that? Uh, no, I would say, you know, just reach out to your local music stores with questions, concerns, and find out what they have to, to bring to the table to help you out. And then, you know, make your decision based off of that. And, you know, we're one big happy family. You know, not every music store is out there to just make and steal every dime that we can possibly get our hands on you know the ones that are advocating for music in the schools helping you recruit they want to see music thrive in the community not just tomorrow but a hundred years from now they this very passionate people that care about music and what it's all about and just encourage you to work with those those stores meet up with them and talk to them and figure out how they can make your life easier. Use them. That's the, that's the, the crazy part. I, there's some days I pull my hair and I'm like, come here if you need me. <laughs> All you got to do is call me. Let's talk. Let's figure it out. Live to valuable serve. resources. <laughs> it's very true. And you have some great connections in with other teachers in the community too. And I think that is a really useful resource as well that we, we haven't touched on about music stores is that you know all the other music teachers in the valley, who they are and what they're like. And and I feel like as music teachers, we end up being so isolated sometimes. I mean, they, they push us to the back of the school, you know, and then we're too busy <laughs> listening to playing tests or something that we don't go to the faculty room for lunch. So we end up just being so isolated unless, you know, we might have another music teacher in the school. But um, gosh, the only person I get to talk to most of my days is the, the secretary in the office because my classroom is so isolated. But you know everybody if you work at the music store, right? And can connect people. Yeah, and you know, and you also know the other teachers in your district. I, this is the one, you think they would have more like support groups. You know, get together with them once a quarter, you know. Hi, my name is Elise and I spent all my repair budget. How can you guys help me? And then <laughs> and then, you know, the other four chime in, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? I mean, you know, there's there's mommy's groups, there's, you know, dudes day out at the golf course. Why not put together something like this where even if it's just a chat room kind of a thing or get five people involved on text kind of a thing, just always ask people's opinion. Because as we know, musicians have no problem giving their opinions on <laughs> any and everything so that's very true yeah we may as well um have like a choir director's wine club right you meet once a month and talk about your students <laughs> yeah uh, you mean wine w-h-i-n-e right oh right yes <laughs> wine okay. wine wine and wine so that would be <laughs> that'd be fun the more wine the more wine together. Yeah, I expect to see uh, the Utah National Chapter organized by you very soon. 
<laughs> but I'm in Colorado. I'll, I'll organize the Western Colorado one. We have lots of good wineries Great. here. Excellent. Mm. Well, thank you, Chris, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And some great information for those of us who are wanting to get more money for repairs and, and advocate for equipment replacement and repairs and just keeping our program up and running so that we can do the most important work, which is in the classroom with those kids, mitigating the spit ending up on people's shoes, right? That is right. Well, Keep Up the Good Work is a great podcast and look forward to uh, learning a lot more from you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks. I do hope you got as much from that interview with Chris as I did. I can't thank him enough for taking the time to chat with me. Once I stopped the recording, he actually said something very powerful, and it's this one statement I hope you remember. Whatever your purchasing department happens to be, your school, your district, whomever, they don't know what it is you need. You are the authority here. They don't necessarily understand what happens in the classroom. Most of them have never even been in a classroom as a teacher. They don't know the difference between a sound shell made by cardboard or one made of fiberglass, one made of wood. They don't know if there's a difference in fingerboards versus, you know, plywood or ebony. To them, it's all the same. They look at the price. That's why one of the things Wendy Higdon and I will be talking about in our upcoming webinar is how to shift your mindset to think like an administrator. It's one of the most important things you can learn that will make your job so much easier as a teacher. And something else that will make your job easier is by using smart music. Don't just take my advice you can give smart music a try completely for free right now. Just navigate over to smartmusic.com and sign up. And I just have two words for you. Practice loop. If you haven't visited your local music store in a while either, I encourage you to get down there, make friends and see what they can do for you. They are your biggest advocate. If you need help finding them, finding out who's really important, check out nasmd.com and you can look up the stores that care the most about supporting your school music program. Remember also to look for the download that comes along with this episode. In this instance, it is five tips that I are ways that you can leverage your relationship with your music store to get more for your program. So be sure to check that out. Also, all of the links that we talked about in this week's episode are in the show notes. So be sure to check those out as well. Please share this podcast with your music teaching friends, subscribe and leave a review. We'll be back next week or next time with Wendy Higdon, and we'll be chatting about how to get you more instruments, more equipment, whatever it is you need to do your job that's the most important. And that's what's in the classroom. Until then, be good. Keep teaching on. 